You're listening to Win Win, an entrepreneurial community with your host, Ben Wolf. And welcome to the Win Win podcast. This is Ben Wolf, your host, as always. Uh, welcome today. And I want to learn, and we're going to learn from our guest today. For those people that are independent professionals, consultants, fractional executives, fractional leaders, how to bridge the gap between a full-time job and a full client load. I uh, ask you guys to pause, stop, leave a review, subscribe, follow, like, whatever it is that you're allowed to do on the platform on which you are listening to or watching this. Uh, and with that, I want to get into introducing my guest today. He and his business partner, Taz Tadhukan. And you're going to have to tell me if I, how, I mis- how specifically I mispronounced that in a minute, uh, who uh, co- co-founder, uh, co-founders of Centricity. Centricity provides early stage consultants and fractional executives with a 12 month structured business development coaching program to bridge the gap between full time salary and full client load. That's our topic today. Uh, You can find out more about them at Centricity B2B. That's the number two, centricityb2b.com. With that, I give you Jay Kingley. Welcome, Jay. Thank you, Ben. Real pleasure. Well, very happy to have you here. This is a hot topic for a lot of people and a little bit of 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 a divergence from our, our typical target market of the business owners, but a lot of people in the fractional leadership space and in the entrepreneurial world in general uh, do listen to this show. So I guess the first thing I want to ask you is to give us a little context. How did it come to to pass that you are speaking about this topic? So I I started my post business school career in the consulting world. I I was with uh, two large uh, consulting firms, one strategic, one focus on management. And my first, you know, I rose up the ranks because I did great client work and got to the point after uh, three and a half, four years that I was eligible for partner and I was ambitious as a young man. So I said, this sounds great. And then I realized that partner is a glorified term for salesperson. And it's really about can you bring in the clients and manage the relationships. And that really wasn't me. That wasn't how I saw myself. Uh, and I looked at how other the other partners were doing it, and I cringed. I just couldn't do the whining and dining and the entertaining and the back slapping and a few things which might have been appropriate uh, in the 80s and 90s, which I won't mention today because it's sort of not so appropriate. Mm-hmm. And... I really wondered if this was the right move for me. Maybe I should just leave and do something else. But I decided I would give it my best. But if I was going to fail as I expected to do so, I was going to do it on my terms. So I did the whole business development completely differently in a way that was very comfortable for me to do and very natural. And much to my surprise, it worked to the point where in under two years, I became one of the top revenue generating partners, even though I was fairly young. Oh. Um, and, uh, you know, I ended up leaving, doing an entrepreneurial interlude as a founder, and then went back into the consulting world this time, different firm as a partner, uh, and took uh, a P&L that was 4% of the company, and in uh, four years, made it 40% of the revenues in a, oh. in a business where we tripled our revenue. So it was an enormous growth. And I used the same principles of, and, and I'll get to that, you know, what, what was it? And the, so many people would have looked at me and they would have said, oh, you're a rainmaker. You attract all this business. And if, and at the time I had my colleagues who would say to me, how are you doing it? And I would legitimately tell them, but it made no sense to them. And uh, as a result, they uh, they basically thought I wasn't a great team player because I wouldn't tell them the secret, even though I really was. But the truth is, I and most rainmakers don't know how you do it. Uh, because here's a little tidbit. A rainmaker typically is really bad at sales. So if you looked at classical sales, they okay. would be viewed as don't know what you're doing. Uh, a huge disinterest in marketing. So they're not about doing all the marketing that you would imagine one needs to do. What do you mean bad at sales? Uh, So there are certain techniques, certain ways that you, you know, discover needs and you sell to the need and you make the problem 
you know, big, but you give them a little hope. You learn how to deal with objections, right? That's the thing that people love about sales training. Tell me how to deal with objections. And, you know, where I would say you don't, right, deal with objections at all. Like if they object, you move on. Um, so the real art is how do you prevent an objection? So the way that they will teach even today how to do sales, most rainmakers would flunk that test, mm -hmm. right? They don't do it that way. In fact, most rainmakers would say they don't sell. In fact, that's what I w w used to say. I say, well, I talk to my clients and my prospects and surprise, surprise, at the end of the conversation, they ask me, hey, Jay, could you help us with this issue? May not even have been the issue I was talking to them about. And, uh, you know, by the way, we'll give you a million dollars, two million dollars for you and your team to do this. And I'd be like, uh, sometimes I would say, well, that actually doesn't make any sense. It's not what you need. But I'll tell you what I will do is uh, happy to take your money, but we'll do something that actually adds value. But I was never asking for work. I never pitched. I never sold anything. They just asked me to help them out on, on whatever the issue of the day was. So that's what I mean. This is how a rainmaker does it. They don't sell at all. And they don't do marketing the way most people look at marketing. And they don't, most, don't even like to, what I could say, work the room. They don't like going to networking events mm -hmm. and shaking hands and patting people on the back. So, uh, but at the time, I, I didn't quite understand how what I was doing, why it worked so well. Now, fast forward, um, a big chunk of my career, I decided to to go into back into consulting, this time uh, with my partner, Taz. And, and, to, and can you say her last name? And... Um, we were now going after entrepreneurs. And what I uh, realized was this was very different. I didn't, the way I was going after large enterprises back in the day didn't work when you're going after small businesses and entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. So I was following all the advice that every, all the experts gave you. Networking, joining all the groups, putting yourself out there. And we got clients, we got business, but I was looking at the ROI on my time. And I'm like, this return on time is pathetic, right? All this effort, not getting great results. What is going on? So I finally got frustrated enough and I said to Taz, we should figure this out. So we spent a year and a half researching all this advice that the experts were giving. Because I had to allow, maybe the issue, Ben, was I was really bad at it, mm -hmm. right? It was the right advice, bad execution. But I what I found research. it. Oh, we, uh, we read everything that was out there. We went to lectures. We interviewed other uh, professionals that were in what I call selling services and expertise, other consultants, accountants, lawyers, and really asked them, how are you really doing? What really works for you? And everybody we talked to was having the same challenges that we were. And all this conventional wisdom was nonsense. And that really caused us to explore why was this advice so bad? Why were most people struggling? And that caused me to reevaluate what I did when I was a partner in these consulting firms. And then it all made sense. And we took the aha for how you really do it and decided to pivot our business, get out of the consulting and start a program for people who sell expertise as a business to help them nail their marketing and sales because it is not what they think it is. So let's go to let's go to what they not what they think it is for a second because you you made a comment to me before we started recording about what they think it is. So what do right. people think it is, or why do people go down the wrong path and and spend a lot of time and get a low ROI on their time? Right. So uh, there's really two things that I think uh, mess people up. The first thing that messes people up is, you know, if you take a step back and you say, how do we learn? And I would say the dominant learning model is monkey see, monkey do. And we look at how others do it. We assume they must know what they're doing. And we're like, oh, we should just try to copy it. So most businesses are product commodity type businesses, you know, be a product software as a service, um, uh, retail, e-commerce, direct to consumer. As consumers, we're inundated with this type of marketing. 
But that is a totally different business. That's a feature functions, benefits, price business. So, and it's based on scale and enormous volumes. So everything you do, your delivery has to be scalable, your sales has to be scalable. Think, you know, go to my website and give me your credit card and you, you've bought, right? Um, and therefore your marketing's focused on lead generation, which is these getting massive uh, leads through social media, through search ads, through SEO, and our conversion rates are like a half a percent. And the reason that it works that way is all those businesses have as their scarce resource capital. So you begin to, to look at metrics like, what is my return on investment? Where investment is money. What is my return on capital employed? Right? Everything is about the efficient use of money. And that's what we're exposed to predominantly. Mm -hmm. But th whether you're a consultant, a coach, a fractional, that's not your business. Your business is based on selling, a, selling expertise, which is an intangible service. Your challenge is, because there's a knowledge gap, right, the definition of expertise, I know things that my clients don't know. That's why they're hiring me. So my clients can't evaluate my claims and representations. It's a bit like an auto mechanic. You know, you have a car, you take it to the auto mechanic, and they, to do an oil change, and they come out, and I don't know if you know this, but in their schooling, they practice the long, sad face right <laughs> where they come no. out and they say ben uh you've got problems and uh it's not a 50 dollar oil change it's 500 a thousand dollars of repairs and if you don't do them you're going to break down on the highway and suffer a very painful tragic death so what do you want to do ben and they're telling you all the things that are wrong and you don't know whether they're telling you the truth or they're making it up because they have knowledge that you don't have well in the world that we live in, these, these consultants, coaches, and fractionals, you're the auto mechanic and your clients are the car owners. They have no idea what you're telling them is true or false, right? And I think so many of us don't realize that, that knowledge gap. So that one of the consequences of that is you're not selling features, functions, and benefits. Everything is customized because they have no because they have no way of measuring or understanding the value right. or lack of value on those features, functions, and benefits, quote unquote, of your expertise knowledge. Right. So you're not selling a standardized product, right? You're not selling pens. You're not selling widgets. You're not selling software as a service, right? It's not standardized. Everything is customized. That's why they're paying you the huge dollars. And because of that, sales is done in, the, in, in a one-to-one -one conversation, typically a series of one-to-one -one conversations. You don't, if you're a fractional executive, you don't send people to your website and say, hey, read my, read my landing page, and at the bottom, put in your credit card, and then I'll, I'll start work in two weeks. That's not how it's done, right? So, and therefore, your marketing can't be lead generation because your scarce resource isn't capital, it's your time. So you need to think about return on time, not return on investment. Return on time that I'm spending, not capital employed. So efficiency right. is everything. So when you're marketing, when you're in an expertise-based business, you have to look at it as, I need prospect generation. The last thing I need is lead generation. Because to run a successful practice, you have to have a close rate that's 75% or higher, or else you're going to run out of time. In the lead gen world, if you, you know, the average conversion rate for lead generation marketing is a half a percent. They're two orders of magnitude lower, but that's okay. They make up for it in volume. Right. You can't make up for it in volume because you don't have enough time. For fractional leaders, consultants, et cetera, what are the, what are the biggest things you see them coming into you when they start to come to you? What are the things that they've already tried before that? Right. So they tried um, their network. Now, let me tell you what that most of them do. And it works in the beginning, which is they decide they're leaving their corporate job. They're going to hang a shingle. And they tell everybody they know, oh, by the way, I'm leaving big corporate X. I'm now going to set up a, a role where I can be a fractional CFO, a fractional CEO, CMO, whatever the C-suite uh, title is. And 
because they have had a active network, because there are people they've been in touch with, it's inevitable that there's going to be one or two that will say, hey, Ben, this is great. Actually, I, I need that. I've been looking for somebody and I know you. So can you help me? And this gives this false sense of success. Um, and this will decay over time because networks, people that you know, you don't stay top of mind. And now you're busy doing your work, right? You're not doing any business development. You don't need it. I'm, I'm full booked, right? And then at some point though, you know, it's the definition of a fractional. It's supposed to be a transitionary role, taking them from point A to point B. Mm -hmm. And now they need full time. You're done. Okay. Well, now what? Now you're, you're not top of anyone's mind. Starting from so scratch. all this, yeah, all of a sudden they're like, now what do I do? So then what are some of the things that they start to do? They, they do networking. Well, networking, first off, is a top of funnel. It doesn't get you 75% close rates, but it does get you activity. So you feel like, hey, I'm out there, I'm doing things. But the results are rarely, rarely there because people don't know how to do it. And as a tactic, you know, it's not the greatest tactic for someone who's selling expertise. You know, one of the things about networking uh, that I love to point out to people is when's the last time you heard anybody in the B2B side say, I need to find somebody who can do X for me, right? I need a new accountant. I need a new attorney. I, uh, I could use a, a fractional CFO. I think I'll go to a networking event to find them. Like the next time is the first time. So who goes to networking events? Everybody's selling. There are no buyers at networking events. Everybody's there to sell. I've never met anyone who goes to buy, right? So really, like, so you really think that's going to get you there, right? Your, your target market isn't there. It's just your, everyone else who's selling. So they'll, they'll try networking, but they get a lot of action. They get a lot of conversations. People are always willing to talk. So it's all these vanity metrics. And I talk to people and they'll say, oh, I'm, I'm avidly networking, you know, in person, virtual. And I'm like, how's it going? It's going great, Jay. Right? And I'm like, well, how so? Oh, I met a lot of great people. I bet you did. Right? You having any conversations? Oh, the conversations are amazing. Oh, great. A any proposals? Well, you know, it's funny you ask. I've got one or two out there. Any closed? No. How long have you been doing this? A year. Okay, there we go, right? Maybe it's not working so well uh, for you. So, so they'll try that. Um, LinkedIn is a big one, you know. So everybody wants to go on LinkedIn, and they they put posts up. And what are most of the posts up about them and their business? Hey, I can help you with this. Hey, if you need this, here's me. Here's my qualifications. Um, they uh, they'll hire LinkedIn uh, marketing experts. And they do what I call the connect and pitch. And you know what I mean because everybody who's on LinkedIn gets yeah, pitched I get all a ton the of time. those. Right. So they connect stopped, with you. Yeah. I stopped accepting connection requests where almost always where there's a message in the connection request. Right. I almost stopped. I almost always stop accepting those. Yeah. And, and they're, it, usually not, they're, they're likely just doing it to sell. Like, unless it's something super customized, I know it really was me specifically, right. then I just, I don't right. need that. <laughs> and, and they all start with, because they're all using the same formula. Ben, I'm looking to connect with high quality people like you. And that's all they say. Yeah, it's and then generic, you connect. totally generic. Yeah, and then they come back and they say, Ben, now that I get your first message, real pleasure to be connected with you. And that's all they say. And you're like, wait for it wait for it right <laughs> next day hey do you need here's my pitch right yeah. so whether they're doing it through posting whether they're doing it through uh connect and pitch techniques um so that they're thinking well my audience is on linkedin my target market so so let me go after them on linkedin um so they're using these tactics and they're making it about themselves let me tell you ben what i can do for you let me tell you how I can help you. But that's all about me. And I'm asking you to figure out whether you really need me. So they try all these tactics. Why? Because that's what they're exposed to. Even though they know it doesn't work when they're on the receiving end. But right. that's all they know. 
right? So let's, so, let's go to, yeah, so yeah. what does work? What do people, what, what either mindset or technique or whatever shifts do people need to make to realize, hey, for this knowledge business, yeah. from, from products and services, what, right. what does work? Okay, so let's talk about step one, right? So I would argue there's really five things you need to do, five areas. Step one is you have to have the foundation for your business, and that is all about focus. So who are the decision makers that you want access to? Who, you know, what types of companies, i.e. what's the target market look like, right? Where are these people hanging out and willing to engage? Because they're not going to come to you, you've got to go to them in whatever format they're going to engage in. So because your scarce resource is time, you have to really focus. And I don't mean niche. Niche is a different concept. I don't normally recommend niching, but I do mm. recommend focus, right? Focus in, right? Decision maker, target market, the channel that you're going to reach them in, your message, your service, laser focus. That's your foundation. And what's going the difference build... between that and, ni and, and, and niche? So a focus is a concentrated application of force at a given point so that you can So meaning you could do it in 50 places, but you Correct. don't try to do that. You just do it in one place. Not you do about, it in one a, and then specialty. Right. And then as you get established, you can add a second. You can add a third. You can bring in a partner to your business who allows you to go after more. So at every element of, you know, decision maker, target market, channel, you always have focus. You are always putting a sufficient level of resource into that in where someone spot. ambitious is just saying i'm doing this tiny little thing and that's all i do very very narrow right and that that is a different concept than focus all right so we're about focus and your focus can augment it can change over time all right so it is much more expansive than someone who is niching themselves out Okay, because you can niche and not have focus. I can right. niche on a particular problem that I solve, but be in way too many channels right. with messages that don't line up and contradict each other, and you have no focus, even though your business is niche. So it's focus. about focus more than niche. Okay, so you you start there, and and that's your starting point. All right. Then, given that foundation, the most important thing that you have to do is position yourself in the market, and all I mean by position is, how does that decision maker see your relevance compared to other alternatives that they have? And then how do you communicate that positioning? So everything someone in the consultant fractional space is doing, every communication is actually a positioning statement. And you're either going to reinforce it, you're going to contradict it, or you're going to confuse it. All right? Now, most people don't think that everything they say, even an introduction, I'm at a networking event. Jay, take 30 seconds, introduce yourself. That's a positioning statement because I'm telling you how to look at me. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, if, if I can, Ben, let me, let me give you an analogy of okay. what we recommend and what works unbelievably well, okay, for, for people, people in will the love to hear this. business. Okay, <laughs> so I want you, because we all experience things uh, in our own way, I want you to imagine, and I want our audience to imagine, that they're sick. And I want you to imagine that here's your symptoms. You've got a cold, congestion, runny nose, you have a dry cough, you have a fever, and you have muscle aches. Those are your symptoms. Now, one thing that comes to mind is let me go to a drugstore. I'm going to buy decongestant, cough medicine, and ibuprofen, which by the way, so I'm told, will deal with the fever and your muscle aches, right? Ooh, so there I go, I get those three things. And I treat myself. So what am I really doing? I am symptom shopping. Mm -hmm. I, I have symptoms, I'm looking for something that right. will get rid of That's what people my do. symptoms. That's what people do, right? Now let's take cough medicine. Now imagine you were the manufacturer of cough medicine. Do you have any competitors? Yeah, like hundreds, right? You go into an, a, a big a big drugstore and you're going to see hundreds of cough medicines. And what's the difference between them? Well, there's a flavor difference. They come in different flavors because unflavored cough medicine is disgusting. So they put a lot of sugar and they put a flavor. Grape, strawberry, cherry, right? 
But then you realize that every competitor offers the same flavors. All right. And then there's drowsy and non-drowsy. Maybe you want both. And every competitor offers a drowsy and a non-drowsy. Okay, so there's no difference. So what, what do I go for? Oh, price. How many people do you know would pay a massive premium for a cough medicine at the drugstore? Like nobody. So price becomes really important. Why? Because as the consumer, you have a lot of alternatives. Right. And when you have a lot of alternatives, it begins to feel like a commodity. How do you buy commodities? It's on price. Okay, so that's why you don't see much variation in price of cough medicines because it's just a commodity. Now, why did you go even to the drugstore in the first place? Because you're sick and it's important to you that you get rid of this stuff. But now you decide it's also urgent. It's not just important, there's an urgency. Now you're thinking maybe the drugstore isn't the right answer. So what's the big alternative? I go to the doctor, right? Now, I want you to imagine this. You go to the doctor, you tell the doctor, here are my symptoms. And the doctor says nothing and does nothing except the following. They reach into a paper bag and they pull out a decongestant cough medicine and ibuprofen and they slide it across the table and they say, pay on your way out. How do you feel about that doctor visit? It's pointless. It was pointless, but the doctor just recreated the drugstore and you had no problem when you went to the drugstore. Why is it unacceptable that the doctor recreated something that you are otherwise happy with? Okay, well, here's the difference. Because your expectation of the doctor is that they would examine you and diagnose you. Because you know that you can't treat the symptom, you gotta understand the cause and treat the cause. Now, cough medicine manufacturers, they'll do all sorts of advertising, TV, social media, pay-per-click on Google, God knows, billboards, side of buses, you name it. How many doctors, say primary care physicians, are doing that type of marketing? None, all right? What type of marketing do primary care doctors do? Oh, they don't market, right? Well, how do they sell you? They don't sell you. Why? Right? Don't try to get an appointment. It's tough, right? Because people are contacting them. Clients are contacting them. That's not true when you're selling cough medicine. Mm -hmm. All right. So the value the proposition. Is yes. So scarce. what's different, right? So 98% of consultants and fractionals and coaches act like they're cough medicine people. And they're, they're saying, you have this symptom, I treat the symptom, I treat the symptom. So it's competitive, savvy clients say, well, I don't know that I need you because I don't yet understand my problem, right? 20% of the time, they know what the problem is and they can look for a solution. 80% of the time, they experience symptoms, they don't know what's causing it. So how do you know what solution you need? Right. Are, are, are oh. you saying that the discovering the underlying issue is is the quote unquote sales process, which is not a sales exactly. process? Exactly, exactly. So what is it that rainmakers do? I want to go back mm -hmm. to my point about rainmakers I talked about. Because I told you they're bad at sales, they're disinterested in marketing, and they don't like to work the room for the most part. Mm -hmm. So what makes a rainmaker a rainmaker is they diagnose. Mm -hmm. Clients know that when they've got something that's not right and they can articulate their symptoms, but they don't understand why, they call a particular subset of consultants, fractionals, coaches, and they say, Ben, we need to talk. Let me tell you what's going on. Give me some insight here, buddy. Help me figure this out, right? But 98% aren't doing that. They are positioning themselves as symptom treaters which is the commodity part. Very few have a positioning that's based on the ability to diagnose. And that's what a rainmaker does. And it's rare. And that's why they have trouble articulating why they're so successful, why clients call them and they're not having to call them, why they're being asked into the conversation rather than trying to butt into the conversation. Because they do something that the others aren't doing, which is they can diagnose. Now, here's the deal. 
okay? If you have expertise in a certain area, let's say you're, you're a fractional CFO, mm -hmm. and you know your target market doesn't have a CFO, but now they're big enough that they need one. Would you know the symptoms they're experiencing? Yeah. You ought to, or how good could you possibly be? Yeah. Right? Now, when you, in your positioning, articulate, I bet you're suffering from this. You are establishing empathy with your target decision makers. They're like, oh, Ben, yeah. I mean, I, you know that? Wow, you sort of get me. And empathy trumps expertise every day of the week when it mm -hmm. comes to the purchase decision. We don't want to work with someone who doesn't understand us, no matter what their reputation is. You hear it all the time. Yeah, you know, Jay's great. Seems like he's brilliant, but he really didn't get my situation. So I'm not going to work with him. I'd rather work with someone who doesn't have nearly his qualifications, but who really understands me. All right. So when you can empathize on this, this symptom and you can initiate that because you know what they're experiencing, you now have empathy where everyone else is saying, hey, do you ha if you have this symptom, I can help you. Where the, the savvy uh, consultant or fractional says, I know you have the symptom. You don't have to tell me. I know you've got this. And by the way, if they don't, they're going to tune you out, but they're not someone who's going to need you right. anyway. So great, because what's important is time. It's not just attracting the right people. It's preventing the wrong people from chewing up your time because right. that's what's in short supply. All right. So now you've got empathy. And now you say to them, let me tell you what's causing it. Now, either I know it could be one of three things. And in marketing, of course, it's not one to one, it's one to many. So I'm going to say, here are the reasons why you're going to, why you're suffering from that. If I'm sales, which is just a one to one conversation, it's all sales is. Now I can ask you a question or two, just like the doctor. And figure in minutes, it is. Yeah. yeah, and in minutes I can figure it out because I've seen this movie a hundred times. It's your first, but not my first. Right. So let I can me, very quickly you, say, boom, boom, boom. God. Let me ask you just because we're, we're getting short on time, like to, yeah. to help. To help people yeah. on, like see themselves in this, like maybe you could share an example story, maybe like a recent client, like you know what, like before and after, like what were they, what were they going through, what did they change about the way they did business development, if we're going to call it that, and then, uh, and then what happened afterwards? Right. So uh, take someone who was a, a fractional CFO and looked at his go-to-market. And his, he didn't really have a go-to-market. He was, I, I have these skills. This is what I'm good at. And he was going out on LinkedIn and in various business groups, mm -hmm. you know, call it the networking side. Right. And he would say, hey, this is what I'm good at. You know, I do these things for clients. Do you need someone with these services? And again, it wasn't that he had zero, but he wasn't fully occupied. He didn't have any real consistent, reliable pipeline. So it was very hit and miss for him. And it was very frustrating because he felt quite accurately that he had a lack of control. So we sat down and we focused him in on who really are the right people for you to deal with. And it was really understanding what is it that he was really good at, right? So where was his expertise? Where was his passion? Because that's equally important. And then what types of issues, symptoms and problems where that that would play in? And then who has those types of issues? Mm -hmm. right? So now we have focus. And then the marketing becomes articulate, pick one symptom that you really deal with, right? Articulate the symptom. Talk about the diagnosis, right? What's causing it? Put the solution on the table. High level, strategic. It's called a game plan. Talk about the impact of what happens when you implement this solution, both objectively on the business, right? Which is what drives importance. Right. And importance drives engagement. So engagement's great, but it's not action. And so then we have to do the second part, which is driving action, decision, and that's always driven by emotion. And it's the emotion to the decision maker, right. where the How importance is to the business, the 
urgency is to the individual making the call, right? So in this case, it was to business owners because that who, who was going to hire him, CEOs, business owners, because mm-hmm. he was the fractional CFO, right? So we make that case, and then you lay out, here are the key things that you need to do to implement my game plan. And you say it in a way that's not, let me tell you what I would do to help you. Right. You just say, this is what you need to do, client. Do it on your own. Because this is what happens when you do that, right? The client says, well, I don't know how to do any of that stuff. Right. It makes sense to me. I get it. Right. I don't know how to do it. So Ben- That black box can, like the mechanic. Correct. Yeah, so Ben, how, how can you help me? Like, I get it, but I need help. Can you do that for me? Well, thanks for asking. But see now, are you selling? No, you're letting people buy. You're not pitching yourself. In fact, when you walk through that framework, you've never once talked about yourself. You've never told people what you do and what your business is. You're talking all about them. 100% focus on them. Right. And that's why they're interested. When you start saying, well, let me introduce myself. Let me tell you what I do. Everybody tunes out because they don't really care about you. They got their own problems to worry about, their own business. So don't talk about yourself. No first person. It's right. all about them. And then they, they're they like, go along, go along. And it's that last step when you say, here's what you need to do. That's when it dawns on them. Oh my gosh, I need help. I need someone to help me do that. And who are they going to ask? Well, the person that has empathized with them on the symptom has given them the insight on what's causing, or maybe it's one of three things, and I can figure that out with this is what the this is how you solve that. And you're not talking to anybody else. You're not saying, Great, let me look on the shelf to see what other cough medicines there are. This is you are now in a category of one. Everyone else is in a category of hundreds of thousands, not you. Right. Category of one. And now they don't see you competing with the others. So not only are they asking you for help, they as you establish this reputation in your target market, they will reach out to you every time there's an issue in your space, right? And they will tend to talk about you because you're truly remarkable. Oh my God, you know, this guy figured this out. I can't believe it. And I'll tell others who might use you, not because I'm trying to get you a referral, because I don't care about you. I care I'm about me, but I'm, I'm just excited. Like I want to share with other colleagues, with other peers in other companies. Right. And then sometimes that, so not only you can do this professionally, but, but you get this true word of mouth that's really valuable. And now the, the cherry on top is you're going to charge at least 25% more than all your competitors. Because you're not a commodity. You're not a commodity. And your client's going to say, Ben, you're cheap at 10 times that price because you're not picking issues where the return on investment for the, cl- for the client is small. You're picking issues, symptoms, where the ROI is astronomical. Right. So well, your price is sort of irrelevant right. to the value that they're looking at. Now, I'm not right. saying you rip people off. But 25% premium, and by the way, because of the nature of a fractional business, that all goes to the bottom line. Because right. the difference You're between so revenue low, yeah. and income is very, you know, they're, they're, yeah. they're almost few, the same few thing. Expenses, very few expenses. Yeah. So, you know, how do you make more money? You position yourself where you, one, are efficient so that your billable, your utilization on the time you want to be billable is over 90%. You have a pipeline that continuously refreshes itself because they call you, you're not now soliciting them because you have this reputation in the marketplace and your price point's higher and you multiply all that stuff together. Now you are well off, right? Steady, secure, you're not as stressed. You don't have to do that hustle and grind. and the burnout, the burnout doesn't typically come from doing what you love to do for clients. The burnout comes with how do you, you know, of all that effort of getting clients and the frustration and the the low return on time, which burns right. people out. Right. right? This, this is this gets rid of all of it. Right. Now, this is awesome as a huge amount into a very small amount of time that you were able to get 
again, people can learn more about, you know, again, getting, getting you and, and Taz's help, centricityb2b.com. Really, really appreciate uh, you coming out, Jay, and taking the time for this conversation. Really, really appreciate it. Thank you, Ben. And everybody else, we'll see you on the other side. Thank you. You're listening to Win Win, an entrepreneurial community with your host, Ben Wolf.